sorry that I'm forcing everyone to switch languages. Uh, my great-grandfather did emigrate from Sweden to uh, America. He ended up being a, a farmer in western Washington. And, uh, but somewhere along the line, um, we just lost the language. Uh, but in any event, I appreciate you indulging me. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about here is uh, term sheets, obviously. Um, and we are really fortunate that we have um, two very experienced people up here in Sweden who are working with a lot of term sheets. But before I get into it, I'm just kind of curious out there, how many of you are entrepreneurs in the audience? And how many of you have ever received a term sheet from a venture capitalist? Good for you. How many of you would like to receive a term sheet from a venture capitalist? Oh, I bet you there's more. Uh, and when you're done here, hopefully you'll know a little bit more about what this is about. Um, are you, okay, I'm sorry. So before we get into uh, the term sheet, first of all, um, I wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about actually how you go about raising financing. And um, I'm from America, so I know how it's done in America, but I've been here in Stockholm now. This is my second time. So I don't claim to know exactly how it's done up here. But in America, there are a lot of securities laws and restrictions that would prevent you from, for example, placing a TV ad or a radio ad. Some of those are, are changing. But I'm just curious for the panel, what are some of the, the laws or the restrictions on people going out and trying to raise capital? Uh, there's one limitation if you're a private company. Uh, you can't um, go on TV or in newspapers to more than 200 people because then you have to be a public one. Uh, but I'm not sure regarding crowdfunding if that's uh, changing. I, uh, I don't know that. No, hmm. no. But, but, but you know, generally, I think I think we have a lot less uh, issues with that in in Sweden. I think there are very few entrepreneurs that feel limited by by that specific factor over here. So theoretically, you could get on a street corner, go on TV, or place a radio ad, and say, "Hey, I have this great new idea." Yeah, that's pretty yeah. much how we meet our entrepreneurs. So yes. Okay. Okay. So that's that's interesting. And just FYI, when you when you're reading about some of the stuff on TechCrunch and the like. You'll see a lot of discussion right now about the change in the law in the United States to allow people to engage in what's called general solicitation. So um, assuming that you haven't broken the law by finding your investor, then you get into what is a term sheet? And so, um, and what is the purpose of a term sheet? And, and so, First of all, I think if you go way back in time, 50, 60 years, when the first term sheet was delivered, it was probably pretty simple. Like, uh, we will invest $50,000 in an exchange we want 70% of your company. Actually, actually, that was one of the original venture deals. Um, but it was pretty simple, and there wasn't a whole lot of terms. I, I wish Gustav were here, because I think what um, I would be interested from both of your perspective is, which is better? Is, le is less is more or is more less when it comes to a term sheet? What do you typically see in terms of complexity? So why, don't, why don't you start? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good question and, and it, I think it varies. Uh, so uh, Creandum, the firm I, I work for, uh, we, we invest primarily in early stages. So that is seed, seed rounds and A, a rounds of financing. And so in those stages, really, complexity doesn't add that much, neither in terms of deal nor in terms of term sheet. So we try to keep it easy. Our, our term sheets are three pages. And so, uh, and so in there are you know, the, three, the three main parts, I guess, is the, the size of the round. I think you'll get back to this later on. But the size of the round, the size of our commitment um, as, as the, the cornerstone, one cornerstone. The second part sort of governs the way we want to work with the entrepreneur and the way the entrepreneur expects us to work with them. So those are things around board, board composition and, and uh, and the mechanisms for taking decisions, et cetera. And then the third part is, is sort of the only part that has any legal binding attached to it, and that is around confidentiality, right? So, and, and exclusivity. Maybe there is a, maybe there is a period of time where, where, where the company commits only to discuss with, with us or, uh, or the other, uh, other parties in the term sheet. Um, pretty similar here. Uh, I, I, I represent Alma Invest and the, the pre-seed. If Kranim is seed, I would say really pre-seed. Uh, and we, we don't of, um, 
Not all the times we use term sheets, but in the cases that we do, it's the similar ones. It's simple, uh, but uh, I see it's it's important to discuss these questions before uh, finalizing the discussions regarding on the size and valuation and uh, the decisions being made and the board of directors and so on. So it's an important discussion to have. Um, okay, so not to put you on the spot here, but you did send me your standard term sheet. Do you know how many pages that one is? Uh, I think it's five, the one I sent you. Okay. Um, Something around there. It's 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 eight, yeah. yeah. So, um, and 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 this gets back. It's a very comprehensive term sheet that pretty mm -hmm. much hits all the issues, mm -hmm. um, which are obviously always going to be negotiable. Yeah. Um, but let's let's talk about how this works as a practical matter. I mean, I think if you read TechCrunch, and I'm sure most of you guys read some of these blogs where people talk about how much money they're raising at these crazy valuations and the like. I guess first and foremost, uh, from a matter of sort of protocol, politeness, um, if you're the entrepreneur and you're meeting with prospective investors, one of the key questions is, who gets to decide, A, what does the term sheet look like, and what are some of the key parameters like valuation? And I, you know, I wish, again, Gustav was here, because when you're dealing with um, different players, you know, friends, families, and fools, uh, you may, as the entrepreneur, be obligated to come up with the terms, right? Because, you know, what are you going to negotiate with your friend? And so usually in that case, it is the entrepreneur who comes up with some of these. And, and actually, this term sheet battle originated in part was when I first moved to Denmark and I went to one of these demo days for uh, Startup Boot Camp. The problem was a lot of the people coming out of the demo really didn't know what the deal was. They didn't have a term sheet, and that was actually one of the reasons why I started to do these programs. But getting back to, you know, at, at this point, since Gustav's not here, your firm, well, actually both of your firms, come in at a very early stage, right, the seed stage, professional angels, institutions. What is the protocol? Who sets the term sheet? Who gets to decide? We get to decide right. <laughs> most of the times. Uh, since we are often the very first investor, uh, there's a couple of uh, founders coming to us. Uh, they usually haven't done this before. So uh, I think we decide, but um, we, we also have done this many, many times. Uh, and just to bring it up to the table. Um, yeah, I think I think the goal uh, fr from our perspective, the goal with uh, with the process leading up to the term sheet is to make the actual document as little frightening as possible, right? So try to try to talk, uh, you know, discuss what what the terms should be. I mean, oftentimes the entrepreneurs have some expectations around how much money they want and and the the, the valuation of the company, or rather maybe the dilution, that is sort of the main the main uh, the main pain point when raising capital. I think. And so uh, we try to address those in the discussions leading up to the term sheet. We also try to prepare for those other, those other terms that are in the paper that, that might seem threatening when you, when you see them the first time. But we, we try to explain them and, um, and so hopefully by the time it's actually put in front of the entrepreneur in writing, it doesn't seem very far off from what we've been discussing up to that point. And so, and so you could argue that may maybe in, in nine times out of ten we hold the pen uh, but the terms that are in there, uh, I mean, they reflect the, the negotiations and the discussions we've had up to that point. And how, how negotiable is it? Um, I would say very negotiable, because <laughs> um, it's not about us stating, stating the terms, it's about us having a partnership. So I think it's really important that we're agreeing on these very important issues. So I think it's a discussion, and yeah, we always get there. Okay, and um, in terms of valuation, which is something people tend to feel pretty strong about, and one of the things we're not going to get into today is how you can play around with the valuation, depending on how the term sheet's structured. But in terms of valuation, for example, at your firm or your firm, um, do you have... Um, a median pre-money valuation for a company at XYZ? Are there, I mean, how, how do you do it? How do you go about figuring out 
what a pre-revenue company is worth. I'm just curious. Uh, I can start. Uh, since Alma Invest is a governmental-owned uh, company, we don't go and drive the evaluations. And as I said before, we're, we're often the first investor investing in a company. So we um, have somewhat standard valuation, uh, somewhere around six, seven, eight million Swedish crowns. Uh, and you get a little bit higher if you have a great team, disruptive technology, and such as um, such as those ones, but and also a bit lower. But I mean, when we go in, there's no uh, it's pre-revenue, uh, it's a huge risk. So um, coming to us with a valuation of 40 million, it's it's never going to work. So we are somewhat standardized. And so, and your job as an investment manager is to source deal flow. Is that correct? Yeah. And so then your job would be to present to a committee. Mm -hmm and defend whatever it is? I mean, so, yeah. so how does that work internally before you go back with one of these proposals? Yeah, uh, and I work mostly with seed. We also have uh, expansion, which had obviously has higher valuation, but I'm, I'm talking more of seed here. Um, but I do, um, I do uh, the deal sourcing, and then we always discuss our cases that we meet in, in our team. So the whole team is on board, and then we have a committee that's actually uh, making the, the decision or uh, giving us the mandate to invest. Um, and you will lead, correct? Yes, I would lead, yeah. Okay, so would, would you do all this on the inside first, come up with what you think the term sheet should look like, and then present, or how does it work? Yeah, yeah. basically, yeah. 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 Okay, how about you? How does it work on, on your side? The, the process is not is not dissimilar. Uh, so we, uh, but we're a small firm. I mean, we're, we're 10... We're 11 people, and uh, and there's currently seven of us on the investment team, and we meet every Monday. Actually, bailed out from the Monday meeting to come here today, but but so and in that meeting, everything is decided. So so uh, so, uh, and it is smart. I mean, as a regardless of what what job you have, it's always smart to sort of uh, check with your friends if if what you're doing seems okay, and so 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 that we do that, and and in fact, we have as a principle not. I mean, before, the, before there's a term sheet on the table in front of the entrepreneur, we've actually, everyone in, at our firm in the investment team has looked at it. And so uh, we're not backing away from something that we've presented in written form because we don't have, we don't have the mandate, right? So before, before that gets there, we're, we're aligned internally. And I think that's, that's pretty important. Okay, so, and then in terms of, by the time you actually present a term sheet, to a, a prospective um, portfolio company, has that also gone out to legal counsel, or is this still being managed internally? Okay, so so uh, so it, that also varies a bit. If if we're talking about seed seed investments, that will be like a couple of hundred thousand euros, five six hundred thousand euros. Those papers might not have been through a lawyer before we present them to the entrepreneurs. They are, as you as many of you know, they're fairly standard. They're you know, there are templates available on the web, and so we, we, we try not to spend time and, and money on that with lawyers. If, if, there, if there's a bigger deal on the table, if it's a big A round or, 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 or later stage financing, we might want to do it uh, just, just because it's, it, it adds complexity. But in, in, in generally speaking, nah, I, no. Do you have legal inside your company? Do you have an in-house counsel? No. How about you guys? No, we don't either. Because we have 350 portfolio companies, and the questions uh, being addressed is so um, widely arranged, so we do externally. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to keep going. So then the question becomes, what is the security? And um, by that, I mean there's a lot of different ways that you can invest in a company. Common stock is at the lowest end of the equity. Um, a lot of early stage companies raise money through convertible debt. I actually see over here in Europe that a lot of the government-backed VC funds do convertible debt, in part because they don't want to talk about valuation. Um, sometimes that's secured, sometimes it's unsecured. There's a, a whole series seed, which is kind of what I'd call a real simple form of preferred stock. Uh, then, of course, there's convertible preferred, which is um, more the kind of thing you would see with a real venture round. And then there's levels of debt. So um, for your two firms, here we go. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Brad. I'm Gustav. Hi, Gustav. 
Welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> I thought it was in 15 minutes, so I thought it was early. Yeah, sorry. It's all right. So um, we, were, we were just going to talk about the security, and I think this is actually a pretty good time for you to, to join us. Um, so before we get into it, maybe, as I understand it, you get in right after the friends, family, and fools. Yeah, we might be the fools, actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so w getting back to the term sheet discussion, it, what do you see? If, if the company only has friends, family, and fools, do they even have a term sheet at this point? Uh, probably not, no. Uh, just a short background. We are a family. Uh, it's a family company called Goldsprung Invest. It's me and my brother and my father, and we invest in early stages. And sometimes we are the fools <laughs> coming in as the first investor. And usually we have a very simple term sheet. Um, it's, I mean, we're getting on, uh, getting into the company uh, on the same table as the entrepreneurs, which means we have just common stock in the company, and sometimes we work with convertibles. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is it one page, three pages, or ten pages? <laughs> <laughs> one very small page, yeah. Okay. All right. So... That's, see, that's really interesting because as you move through um, the stages, obviously it gets more and more complicated because there's more and more. It starts to look like a tort cake, like a German tort cake. Um, what, one of the things, again, before we get going, what are the advantages or disadvantages, in your view, of doing convertible debt? And the basic reason why we do it sometimes is uh, if you can't agree on valuation, uh, it's kind of a good way to postpone that question, which means that if the companies uh, creates a lot of value, they can pay us back the money and we're happy. And if they can't, uh, we convert it and then we get a bigger share of a smaller pie. So if the entrepreneurs are right, uh, they get their so way. So you view it convertible yeah. debt as favorable for the entrepreneur because he gets to use your money now, grow value, yeah, and maybe and convert you? Yeah, and gets a chance to show that the uh, company is actually worth that valuation that, that he or she Do asks you for. use valuation caps? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Maybe you are the fool. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, okay, so let's, let's get in here. When you talk about the term sheets, um, there's basically two things that are happening uh, is if you really allocate it. It's, it's about economic rights. How do you share this, assuming it turns into Spotify or something like that? How, how, does, how does it all come back out to the owners and, and, and debt holders? And also, who gets to decide how decisions are made? Strategic decisions, tactical decisions, and that sort of thing. So from my perspective, those are the two areas where you tend to see the term sheet divide up. Um, and then in the economics, um, before we get into this, we, we've already talked about pre-money, post-money, uh, essentially just valuation. But then let's talk about liquidation preferences, um, because I'm not sure necessarily that everybody might know what that is, but maybe you could talk about what, it, what is a liquidation preference? Me? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, in, uh, in, some, in some instances, pr primarily actually for larger rounds and, and later stage uh, investing, the money comes in with, uh, with a, uh, how should I say, with a prerequisite that's called liquidation preference. It's, it essentially means that if the company is sold at a lower valuation than the valuation that was set in the round, that the money that the investor has brought to the table should have priority out. So if, the, if a company takes in 10 million kroner at the 40 million valuation, pre-money valuation, that means 50 million kroner post-money valuation. If that company later on is still sold at 40 million kroner, so the whole, the whole company sold at 40. Post money was 50, whole company was 40. If the 10 was invested with liquidation preference, it essentially means that that 10, 10 million should be lifted off of the 40 first before anyone gets anything else. And then the 30 that is left should be, should be first used to cover the, the, mon the money that the other shareholders have not gotten because they left 10 for the investor and then shared among, among the rest of the investors or the shareholders pro rata. So it's actually a, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of downside protection for investors, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything to it? Um, no, not really on that one. We, we usually use uh, common stock. Keep it as simple as possible since we're often the fools as well <laughs> and really early. So. Okay, and then uh, vesting and reverse vesting. Um, in the States, it's fairly common to see a founder subject to a fairly long reverse vesting. 
Um, here in Sweden, when I did one of these term sheet battles about a year or so ago, uh, what I encountered was um, that there are some tax issues up here having to do with this, no? It, it, what is your experience? Do you require this? Yeah, I, I can, I'm happy to answer this. This is, one of the, this is actually one of the most important, uh, the most important uh, parts of the term sheets from, from our perspective. So when we invest, we typically do it because we love the team. We, we think highly of the market and we think highly of the, of the product. But, but above everything else, the team is important to us. And so the reverse vesting that, that you talk about, Brad, that is something, that is a mechanism to control what happens if a founder leaves. So that for us, that is probably the, the, the most devastating thing that can happen to a startup. So one of the, one of the persons that we have betted on uh, uh, leaves. And so you know, the, the product, the market can be as good as, as, as they want if, if the team is not there to, uh, to do the job. It's very, it just becomes very hard. And so obviously, it's not only on us that it is a challenge. It is also very challenging for the other founders who remain. So uh, typically, the, the term sheet says that if a founder leaves, the other shareholders have a right to buy shares off of that leaving founder. And the share that the leaving founder has to sell is in proportion to how much time he or she has actually been with the company. So if a founder leaves after six months, it's a, it's a fairly high share that he or she needs to sell. If they leave after four years, it may be zero. So that, that is the mechanism. And, and as long as you do this, um, and, and, and take care and, and make sure that the transactions are made at, at, uh, at decent valuations so that, that they don't, you don't force people to sell shares at zero or close to zero, then that can be enforced also. But, but to us, this is a really important, important part. How about your firm? Um, basically the same, yeah. And what about you? What are you, what are you doing at the early stage? Uh, we usually like to put a, a right of first refusal to buy shares. I don't know this English term is hembud in Swedish, which means that if, if someone leaves we can, or wants to sell the stock, we can, we can buy it. But uh, it's not usually that big question for us. I don't know. Maybe we should think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we also think that we could actually step in and be a part of the management team in the companies we invest. So. So if there's a gap, we, we can fill it ourselves to, to a certain extent while we're looking for someone else. Yeah, so, sorry, can I just add one thing? I think, I think uh, we, we now talk about the, the details in the term sheet. And, and as much as they, uh, they govern the relationship between the investors and the entrepreneurs, what's written there is also a catalyst for the discussions. So if we, if we in our discussions with entrepreneurs, find out that they have a hard time committing to four years working with the company, that is a very, it's a weak signal, and it, it really impacts our interest to invest. And that, go, th th that same th thinking goes for almost everything that's in the term sheet. So it is as much a way of calibrating our view with the view of the entrepreneurs as it is mechanisms for controlling whatever happens in case th things go south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. The term sheet does flesh this out. That's why it's important to actually, in some respects, I think more is better because it, it, it allows you to have the discussion, right? Because if you wait until later and nobody thought about it, then sometimes uh, you're surprised. I'm gonna, I'm gonna whip through here. Um, on the control side, um, there's a, a number of things within any term sheet that basically restrict what can happen either at the board level or at the shareholder level. Um, and again, since I'm getting the, the five minute mark, what I- 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes, okay. So um, let's talk about that. So when you guys come in, how does it work in terms of board of director and shareholder approval? Uh, we're usually joining the board, and then we have uh, on, almost always weekly uh, checkups with the management or the CEO of the company just to discuss very practical stuff. Uh, but the thing is, we calibrate with the entrepreneurs before we invest, so usually we follow the the company, we do workshops, uh, business development with them, and the worst thing that can happen is that we have help them, even if we don't invest, we kind of help them to clarify their business and their market potential. Uh, and that's how we get to know each other and I mean, kind of know if they're committed to four years or, or not. It's mm -hmm. pretty easy to find out during like those So you, you're very hands-on and, yeah, and you would join the board and it sounds like you even roll up your sleeves and do some Yeah, we can actually go in and go on sales yeah. and stuff like that. But the thing is, if we don't contribute to the board, then we shouldn't be there. So. Usually we have it in the agreement that we have a place on the board, and not always, and, but usually the entrepreneurs want us to be there. 
And if they don't, we have a kind of a, another problem. <laughs> so, and then maybe someone else is better suited to be on the board. And then we're happy to be passive uh, owners in that case. Okay, so moving one step up, at, y at your firm, mm -hmm. you'll step in. It's the first institutional round, right? Um, and why don't you describe what you do and when you might exit? Mm. Uh, we also join the board. Uh, if, we, if we are investing on our own, it's typically the, in, the investment manager who's doing the investor investment. Uh, but if we're co-investing, we might uh, put our co-investor in the board on our mandate. So it's not typically that we're forcing ourselves in the board of directors unless the company wants it. Because mm -hmm. uh, usually in the seed stage, there's a couple of founders coming to us. They don't have the formalia, they don't have the, the professional board structure. So that's something that we're um, adding, uh, adding on to. Um, and how question? many boards, realistically, can somebody in your position serve on? Um, I think the limit is somewhere around 10. Uh, and then you're pretty crowded up <laughs> with work. Uh, and I, I, with all my CEOs, I have a weekly a weekly call at least and see how they're doing and if I can help with something. Uh, but I think 10 is a bit much, but it's somewhere around there. So let's say the firm were to attract a, a, you know, a later stage VC firm. They now want to put somebody on the board. Would you at that point sort of say, well, it looks like you're, yeah. uh, you're definitely. well covered and then yeah. you can move downstream and free mm -hmm. up is that right? Yeah. And, and that's Correct. healthy? That's expected? Yeah, and that, that's the, I think that's the governmental, um, the governmental role in this, uh, in this uh, area as well. Because if, if, uh, if there's a bigger VC coming up, uh, we usually play it out our role and we're happy to leave to, to the bigger guys or girls. Okay. And, and what about your firm? Because your, your firm can play a little bit deeper into the cap structure. So what's typical? Uh, we, we typically take a, a one seat on the on the board. Um, typically, when we invest, if it's seed or A rounds, we also invite angel investors to invest alongside us. So, so uh, those could be those could be private individuals with experience from from a specific area of the company, or uh, a specific geography that that is important for the for the growth of the company. And so we add them. To the, to the shareholder base, and uh, a few of them, maybe one or two, also often takes a place in the board of directors. So we, we try to help the entrepreneurs to, get a, to get, a, get a board in place that can, beyond us, also add a lot of value to, uh, to, their, to their work. And so angels for us is really, really, really critical. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of these more technical questions because there are some pretty interesting things happening, I think, as I was preparing for this, uh, last week, Ben Rooney, who's the tech editor for the Wall Street Journal, published an article. And they did an interesting study where they essentially looked at the total amount of venture capital that's being invested in different countries, divided it by the population to come up with venture capital per capita. Sweden came out very high, second highest among the EFTA countries. Ireland's the highest, but Sweden, you know, very close second. And what's fascinating about this is how low the EFTA is in general. Some of these Southern European countries have almost no venture capital. The United States obviously has a, a, a strong venture capital market. And then by far, Israel has the most. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, this may a little bit go against what you said in the beginning. It looks like there's a lot of venture money per capita here in Sweden. Your firm's doing, what did you say, like three deals a week? Yeah, all which, over Sweden, yeah. Yeah, which, you know, seems pretty healthy. I mean, what are your thoughts on the, the state of the venture market up here? Uh, just very quickly, I, I'll, I'll let you uh, fill in, Gustav. But I, I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of money. Uh, in fact, there's probably too little money right now. I, I normally say that the best entrepreneurs will get funded anyway, and that is our, our, our impression from our perspective. So we, we, we need to compete like hell for the best deals. That, that, is, that is our our impression. But it is quite clear that the state of the Swedish venture capital scene right now is probably too small. There are companies that, that, uh, that, that are worth uh, venture type of financing, whether it's for big angels, small angels, or at least professional investors uh, who currently don't, don't get it, I think. What about yourself? Uh, yeah, since I started, uh, there have been several uh, funds that have left this early segment, like the seed stage where I'm at, which I think it's telling. 
So I think, yeah, there's, there could be more. I, we, we meet. So, you, so this surprises you? A little bit, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just compared to other countries. Maybe it's even yeah. worse there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have really great ideas there, so we should need more money to fund them. Well, it looks like there is a lot of innovation. Um, I included this in the slide, which is um, the Global Innovation Index. This was available through the European Venture Capital Association. Obviously, it's a, you know, they have a self-interest, but Sweden ranked as the second most innovative country in the world. So give yourself some applause here. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I, th I think, you know, that's, that's impressive. So there's a lot of great ideas here. Maybe they're undercapitalized. Under um, now the next slide, this isn't a good one. This is, again, the European Venture Capital Association. And you can see there's been a pretty big slide in the total amount of venture money that's being raised in venture funds throughout Europe. Um, a little bit of a comeback. But this is the one that I think is the biggest problem for, for Europeans. Um, and you see it a little bit here in terms of, you know, these fantastic companies coming out of Northern Europe are getting financed at a later stage, but some of that money is coming from the United States. And so you can see the, the, the light blue represents the number of seed and early stage deals. And it looks like Europe's doing a pretty good job of financing seed and early stage deals. The dark blue is later funding. And so this is where you end up, I got five minutes, you end up with something that I think Ben Rooney refers to as subscale. So here in Europe, compared to some companies in um, in the United States, they might raise you know, 20 million bucks to execute a plan, whereas over here people might say, well, prove it to me, and we're gonna give you, you know, maybe five million bucks, and you have to prove it in a couple, three markets. Um, and so then, at the end of the day, when you get into these global wars, you know, who, has, who has the most money, who can expand the fastest, who's going to acquire the other companies, that sort of thing. This is an interesting thing, and I'm just curious, uh, you know, I know you guys, I did share this with you over the weekend, but what are some of your thoughts on, and, and, and how do you see this playing out here in Sweden and in Europe? I mean, Spotify is a great example, right? Because they've raised a lot of money all over. Yeah, I, yeah. So, so this becomes maybe a bit uh, sort of self-centric here. But from our perspective, we uh, at Creandum, we need to build global winners, right? So that is that is the that's the reason investors have uh, trusted their money with us, and that is the reason we do what we're doing. Now, to do that, we you know the, we cannot we cannot underfund our companies. So we need to we need to try as best as we can to give them give them a good shot. And uh, well, I hope yeah, we, we've done okay. I think maybe we could probably do much better. But uh, but what we've done also recently is that we've one of my partners is since uh, since August based in Menlo Park. Um, so the one of the best ways of actually growing a business in the U.S. is to do that together with U.S. based investors. Uh, the best way to get a U.S.-based investor into your company is actually to have some traction over there and, uh, and to have some, some early customers and if you're a consumer service, some good consumer pickup. And so the, our whole thinking of putting Johan there is basically to try to help our companies. We can't, solve, we can't solve everything for them, but we can do something to help them land there and get some traction there. And so we, we, are absolutely, we absolutely agree with you that sort of the, the 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 competition for talent is global. The competition for customers' money is global. The competition for the exit is global. And if we can't if we can't put our companies up for success there, then we should seriously think about what we're doing. Or just partner, right? I mean, because that's really what this is showing. Yeah, and that's also what we're trying to do. But but you know, put put the, the entrepreneurs in a in a position where they can easily get access to U.S. money for their C or D round of financing. Mm -hmm. I agree. We shouldn't com really compete with the U.S. Uh, uh, startup uh, ecosystem. We should collaborate with it. We should be a part of it, and that's. I think that's the best way forward. So I, I really like initiatives such as Sub Forty Six here in Stockholm, but I think it should be based in San Francisco instead. We should <laughs> send over tons of entrepreneurs, yeah, to the U.S. so they can see how big the world is and and what. The possibilities are I mean, so, just yeah. look at that. The number of seed stage financings really isn't that different between the two continents. It's really not. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you have to cooperate and build partnerships. OK. Um, how much time we got? Uh, a few minutes. But we have a question here. 
Yes, uh, we have the question, what type of legal status does a term sheet have? Uh, yeah, I, I believe uh, I believe a, a lawyer would tell you that uh, the only two parts of the term sheet that has any legal validity relates to the exclusivity and to the confidentiality, as I alluded to earlier. So those are the two only terms that are that have some legal importance. Thank you so much. Is there any questions here from the audience? No. Here we have. Do we have a mic? I can borrow your. Uh, I was just wondering, the from from the numbers you showed on the last okay. slide, it seems like Europe is not uh, is lacking uh, venture capital for these uh, bigger. Where where is the European venture capital going if it's not going to um, growing companies? I, is there a, a big flaw here in, in how Europe's uh, market is set up? Or why are we giving everything away to the US? Or is it going to industrial companies well, or what? I can just, I, I've, I've been living in Denmark now for three years and I read about this quite a bit and try to understand some of the differences. Um, the venture capital market is a relatively new market. I mean, if you think about it, 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 it's, it dates back to about 1950, 1960. And the Silicon Valley, it's just like a flywheel. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And one of the things that to keep in mind um, when you talk about this other slide, uh, Silicon Valley gets 40% of the venture dollars in the United States and 33% of the deals. So if you put Silicon Valley up there, I mean, it's, it'd be off the charts. But if you're living in a place like Louisiana or Mississippi, you're not gonna get any venture deals, right? So it's just because, you know, why is London a capital market? You know, who knows why it's a capital market? For whatever reason, the Silicon Valley has developed this huge pool of expertise and resource. And here in Europe, it's a different model. You know, you go down to Germany, and some of these com these companies are like older than America, uh, you know. So I don't know. I'd be curious some of your thoughts here on this. Uh, yeah. So so uh, you know the, the the deciding factor for how much money gets allocated to venture funds is ultimately how well the funds are performing, right? So that you know the, it's not uh, you know well to to a large extent actually. So so in fact, uh, European venture capital has not performed well. And that's a that's a fairly you know good explanation I think. Now, unfortunately, the U.S. venture capital has not performed well either uh, the last ten years. Um, you know, actually, it has not. And so this, this has, it's been a massive shakeout of of U.S. based venture firms. We've seen that as Gustav alluded to earlier, also in Sweden and in Europe. Uh, but but I would I would ex actually expect over the over the next three, four, five years to see more capital being poured back into venture. Not, uh, not least because there has been such an over-allocation to private equity and buyouts. So that will, some of that will inevitably shift back into venture. Thank you, and we end with a big hand to the fantastic panel.